Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Happy to get a full house today. So yeah, I'm Thomas. Um, I work at LocalStack where I mostly drive the engineering and product development efforts. And I was also involved in a lot of re-architecting of the core code base when we move this from a project to a real company. So uh, LocalStack is many things. Uh, we like to say it's a platform for cloud application development and testing. But at the core that makes all of this possible is an open source AWS emulator that's um, uh, on GitHub that you can find. Uh, so maybe just a quick show of hands, like who is working professionally with AWS? Okay, pretty, pretty big crowd. So then uh, LocalStack is maybe for you because uh, LocalStack is also a drop-in replacement for AWS that runs on your local machine. So you can grab your Terraform file or whatever it is you're using uh, you can, sorry, this is a bit small, the code will be bigger later. Uh, you spin up LocalStack, it runs in a Docker container, and then you can Terraform apply, and then you can start pointing all of your other AWS tooling to LocalStack. Um, so we're like just running AWS CLI commands uh, against this infrastructure that we deployed, which is a, a bucket and a queue and a, a event notification. So it seamlessly integrates with uh, a lot of the AWS uh, tooling. And that was a simple example, but if you go to the developer hub, uh, you can find like big uh, application stacks, serverless stacks with like, 15 services, a uh, like, big range of services that we support. So how do we, how do we do it? Like it's a pretty outrageous idea. You know, we go and rebuild AWS. This is like this huge uh, um, system. And there are a few strategies to have. We're, like one is we use Python. Um, and Python is a great language for, for a system like LocalStack because we bring in so many third-party uh, system tools that we need to integrate. Um, and maybe not everyone from the team would agree. It's like, okay, dynamic typing, global state pollution, blah, blah, blah. But in their heart, they know it's, it's the right choice. So if you go to the Docker documentation and you work with the SDK, like this is the amount of Go code you need to just run programmatically Docker run. And we need to do this a lot. And this is the Python code you need. <laughs> So of course I'm gonna choose Python. Like I need all my extra time to read the AWS documentation to figure out how this piece of uh, service works. Um, but in seriousness though, so Python allows us to reduce complexity. It just allows us to get things done really, really quickly. Uh, and reducing complexity also is, is like a big uh, topic. So everything runs locally, um, which allows us to do a, make a lot of assumptions. So AWS you know, is a huge distributed system. It runs on huge data centers. We don't have that. We run in your Docker container and everything's uh, local. So there are much fewer distributed systems challenges involved. There are some. Um, and we can build some of the core services in like really simply. So SQS, for example, which is managed queuing service, it's a pure Python implementation. It has 2,000 lines of code, very simple model. You know, there's an API that creates a new SQS queue, and that's it. Um, we leverage a lot of the open source AWS ecosystem. Luckily, AWS is giving us more and more. Um, we standardize all of the repeatable parts, so service emulators, and I'll talk about this, which is basically our implementations of the AWS services. Uh, we've started standardizing and being very systematic about development, testing, and maintenance of the services. And we really embrace pluggability, and I'll, I'll get into the details of what that means afterwards. So I want to spend some time talking about service emulators because that's the bulk of our work and what the team spends most of the time on. And I want to first start off talking about how it used to be. So before we uh, founded the company and we actually got a team involved, um, this is how things looked like. So when you point your AWS tooling to LocalStack, let's say you have your AWS CLI, you say Kinesis put record. Kinesis is just a managed streaming service, not very important. Um, your client makes an HTTP request and it sends it to a web server that we uh, expose. We call it the edge proxy. And historically, LocalStack was just a wrapper around third-party tools. So we would bring in a third-party system. In the case of Kinesis, there was a thing called Kinesalite. It's still around. Uh, it's a um, emulation for Kinesis. Someone just went and re-implemented Kinesis, so we can sort of uh, take that and unify it under our um, API. This is, again, this is how things used to be. And then we would have just a, a proxy listener around that. And uh, now the, the code begins because I, this is like interesting, I think, um, to understand from a coder perspective what you had to do is there was a simple interface. It was called forward request, and you got the HTTP request parameters. That's it. Um, that's what you got. And then we were able to sort of instrument the requests before we sent them to the back end. So for instance, 
uh, we would have a feature that um, would allow us to configure a certain amount or a fraction of requests uh, being returned, uh, returning an error. So chaos testing, for instance, very useful for that. And um, that we could layer that on top of the third party backends. So that was very useful. And we had a bunch of those. And now uh, problems uh, started appearing. We had more and more services. We needed to start, we needed to integrate the services together. So the services typically don't live in isolation. Uh, they work with each other. And in the case of SQS, for example, there's a lot of code, don't worry about too much about it. But down here, you know, at the, at the delete queue action, we actually had to go to SNS, which is the AWS publish subscribe system, and actually unregister the queue after we deleted it. And you can see actually, okay, now we need to parse the request. This parsing AWS request is non-trivial. Uh, we needed to, you know, we had this big if else blocks with all the different actions to do different things, and it just grew and grew and grew. And you know, we, we had a big uptake in contributors. So this is the, this is the contributor graph in the uh, open source repository. We had increasing number of uh, code commits. And when we started in um, summer of uh, 21 with the company, we had six uh, engineers and now we're almost uh, 30. So we needed a way to sort of systematize all of this. So how it looks now, um, we leverage, again, as I said, a lot of open source uh, tools from AWS. They make it easy for us sometimes. Um, one thing that uh, uh, we use a lot are the specifications from the services. I don't know if you know this, but all of the service specifications are open source. Uh, they are described in a language that they came up with, so it's called Smithy. And you can see, for instance, the Amazon SQS specification here with your operations and the input shapes for the operations and so forth. So essentially, AWS is just a very complicated um, RPC uh, system. And we use uh, Boto, which, uh, Boto Core, which is the uh, AWS SDK for Python. And they actually have concepts now that we can use. So they have a class called service model and operation model, which allows us to just parse this and reason over it. So we can just load the SQS service and then programmatically iterate over all of the operations. So that's very useful, because now we can go and write code generators. So we have uh, just this method, basically it looks like this, it's generate code, we load the service, um, we generate, we basically expand the, the object graph from the service model, we generate all of the types, and then we generate the API, and then we use this awesome uh, Python tooling for um, formatting code, Autoflake, iSort, and Black. And we literally just have a bunch of print statements into this output buffer. And then we format it with these tools and out comes like nice code. So this, this is what it looks like. Um, so you can go and, and scaffold a Lambda, for instance. It uh, generates, you can see the, the types in the preamble. You can go and search for the, for the API. So you have a class here, which is, are all of the um, API stops. And you can search for the create function and see all of the parameters, for instance. OK, and this, uh, this we can now use for several things. So one of the things we do for maintenance is we get weekly uh, pull requests that uh, give us the updates um, of the APIs that have occurred in the last week. So we, uh, we regenerate all of the APIs, and we just do a pull request. And this is how we keep track of what's going on. We can't jump on all of the requests, or sorry, all of the new uh, API methods, obviously. We have a small team. Um, but at least this gives us a way to kind of keep track of what's going on and stay on top of things. So in total, AWS has currently like 350 service specs um, with in total almost 14,000 API operations. And that all amounts to 80 megs of JSON specs. We actually, like, the JSON specification is a big bulk of just the container image, which is kind of silly, but we need it. And in local stack, we currently have um, 93 services implemented and, and growing. So you can see that there's just a lot of code necessary to be maintained. Um, and I'll go into a bit of the strategies that we use to do that. So with, the, with this vast you know, number of services, and, and all of the code generation, that's nice. But if you go and try to generate EC2, for instance, which is the, uh, one of the oldest services and the infrastructure is code, you wait a while. Uh, and then you get a file with almost 24,000 lines of code and 600 API operations. And then you look at this and you're like, OK, what now? Um, so we kind of need to choose what to work on. We do a lot of things reactively. Um, so when uh, people ask for certain operations they need for their stack, we go and implement them. And we kind of uh, choose the ones um, we, we know from, from 
talking to people and looking at usage analytics, uh, what we need to focus on, and we pick those and the rest we do, we catalog and do reactively. But like this system is now much cleaner than before because we have like a structured, uh, we have these API stops that someone can go and implement and the emulator code oftentimes is just pure Python code but very often also we need to bring in third party systems which is also why I can't go into the details of how the services work because there are 93 of them and they all look different. Um, but they're unified under this uh, sort of API. So services sometimes either uh, use backend services, use third party services, like in the case of Kinesolite that I, that I explained earlier where we really use the um, third party tool to emulate the service, or oftentimes it's just uh, bringing up open source uh, systems. Like that is what AWS does all the time. They take your open source project and then they sell it as a service. So Elastic Cache is just Redis as a service, so we just spin up our Redis instance for you. And we have our own uh, package manager abstraction for this. We actually uh, load a lot of those systems lazily because the image would be huge if we package all of these uh, third-party services from 93 services into the Docker image. So we do a lot of that lazily and Python gives us a way of, of easily sort of maintaining our own packages. Uh, and maybe looking into one concrete example to give you an idea is uh, Lambda is a very interesting um, example, but AWS generally is a lot of container technologies. So think of ECS, EKS, those are all like container technologies, so we, we try and use a lot of uh, what AWS gives us here. And in the case of Lambda, for instance, when you go and, you know, uh, Lambda invoke with the AWS CLI, it gets routed through local stack to a Lambda provider, and it does some housekeeping of the functions that are in there. And it actually uses our internal S3 provider to store your code, which is what um, AWS actually does. So it works in the same way. And now we use the Docker socket to instantiate new containers. Um, the containers are based on the Lambda base images that AWS provides. So we used to use a very old kind of unmaintained set of community images that were great for a while, but then they got abandoned and now it's, uh, it, we're much more close, um, closely coupled to AWS, which is good because this gives us what we call the parity, which is you know, behaving like AWS. And we use the runtime interface emulator, which basically just takes an HTTP request and then makes a Lambda invocation out of that. So that is actually a pretty tricky piece of code that they just give us, which is nice. So there's a lot of you know, complexity involved in some of these services, and you can kind of think about, you know, Think of 93 different diagrams that this that look completely different. So um, maybe what's more interesting to focus on uh, also for the Python community is sort of the, the, this, this API wrapper around it and how it works. So I want to spend some time talking about the web application framework that we built for local stack. Um, we serve um, what we call a, the gateway, which was previously this edge proxy, which is the thing that receives your request. It's just a web, web application server. And we serve that through uh, Hypercorn. Hypercorn is uh, an async IO uh, HTTP server that supports HTTP2, which is frankly pretty hard to find a pure Python implementation of an HTTP2 server that does what we want. Um, but because our framework is built on, on Werkzeug, which is the library that also fuels uh, Flask, um, which is all synchronous code, we need like an ASCII whiskey bridge. So we had these conflicting um, requirements that we solve just by building our own bridge. I think Django also has something like this because they have a similar problem. And then uh, we have our own, that's when our framework begins. We have a thing called the handler chain. So a handler chain is just a set of requests and response handlers. And it's an implementation of the chain of responsibility pattern. So if you've ever used like Java X serverlet API, for instance, um, then this may seem familiar to you because that's essentially the, an implementation of this. So we call our handler chain with the request context. The request context just holds the Werkzeug request that comes in from, from the web server and all of the additional metadata um, for the uh, sort of to, to know which service the request should go to. Um, and the, the handler chain, again, holds all of these different requests and response handlers and they enrich the context as the request goes through this handler chain. Um, the, the, the request context gets enriched with all of these, um, with all of the metadata for the AWS request. So this is a, this, this turned out to be really, really useful, and I'll show you in a second why. Um, so this is one of the, one of the handler implementations. It's the, what we call the service name parser. So based on the request that's coming in, we need to route it to the correct service. And it turns out this non-trivial, so this determine AWS service name, I think has almost 1,000 lines of code. If you're interested in how that works, the author sits there. Um, 
And then we just get the, you know, we load the service model now that we know which service it is and we add, attach it to the context. And then we pass it to the next handler, which is, you know, could be the service request parser, for instance. So it only does things when something's in the context. Um, and then we know which parser to pick and then we can parse the request and attach that to the request context. So this is very similar to whiskey middlewares, uh, only that it's, um, it's, it's more sort of in, uh, imperative rather than the, the way that the middlewares work, which is kind of wrapping things like an onion. So I'm not gonna go through this, but this is sort of the, an illustration of the entire handler chain of what's going on. So you can see it's pretty involved. But if you just focus like on the, on the left-hand side, like even just taking a glance at this and uh, looking at the list of request handlers, you can kind of just by reading it, kind of understand what's going on. So you know, there's push request context, parse service name, um, and force course and things like that. So uh, this gives us a way to kind of have one place where we put all of the logic. So this, you're looking at the guts of local stack here, basically. Okay, and um, one thing that we had to do, a challenge that we had to solve, is migrating all of these old uh, service implementations that were using this old uh, proxy listener interface to our new handler chain framework. And the adapter pattern is like the perfect tool for this, and I wanna just briefly explain how we did this. So adapter is just, you wrap something, make it look like something else. And in this case, we, when we started the migration, we started playing around with this new framework, with the handler chain, like we, we did, still didn't have the, the internals quite figured out, but we were able to serve these new uh, service implementations through our old framework by just making this handler chain look like a proxy listener. You remember the, the interface from before, it's just forward request, so it's the same interface. We had to do a bit of sort of um, emulation of this new handler chain within that method. And then, like as the, the migration progressed, it took around a year, I think, uh, to get all of the services migrated. There was a sort of a tipping point where we had more new services than, than the old ones. And then we put this new web framework in place that I just presented, and then we had some legacy services that we need to serve through this old, uh, through the new abstraction. So now we have like the adapter in the other um, direction. So we, we serve this old proxy listener interface through the new handler interface. And I'm not gonna go into the code, but it's just to give you an idea that you can, you know, migrating frameworks in this way with like the simple adapter pattern is just, it was great. So it was, the, it was a very, very useful pattern. Okay, so um, one thing that I, uh, I said in the beginning is we embrace uh, pluggability, and you can you could already see some of that. You know, you can we have this pluggable handle chain where you can just inject handlers and kind of change the flow of the of the request as it comes in. But also a big problem that we had in the beginning was uh, importing. You know, don't worry too much about the the code. It's just a bunch of import statements, which was quite frankly terrible, because we, we had to import all of um, the, the service code, and we just had this one sort of a registry where we just imported the code necessary to start the service. And because transitively it loaded um, quite some generated code, it, just this import statement took about five seconds. Um, so starting local stack was pretty slow in the beginning. There's obviously no way to discover unknown packages, and I'll get into that in a second. And you know, all of the other obvious problems with this. So uh, one thing to understand how local stack is distributed and how it's structured, uh, we have local stack core, um, which is the open source tool, which contains like all of the, the guts of local stack that I'm pre presenting, and a, good, a fair amount of services are open source. Lambda, for instance, open source. And then we have uh, like the stuff we make money with is, is in a um, closed source repository, and we also have an extension system where you can uh, modify local stack and, and plug into specific APIs. For example, this handler chain you can extend. So we had, and, and we need to separate this into different uh, Python modules. So we bring everything together. Uh, and there was a problem of just discoverability. We had to discover the code in, in the different distributions. Oops, sorry. Yeah, this is what happens. There we go. So we built a system. Um, it's called Plux. It's basically a dynamic code loading framework, also open source. And it solved the problem that um, other plugin systems have, uh, which is discoverability of entry points. So entry points, um, maybe a quick show of hands. Who knows about Python entry points? Okay, very few people. So it's basically a way for um, your Python distribution to expose uh, code to other distributions 
And a lot of uh, systems use this. You may not know about it, but Setup Tools, for instance, actually uses, um, uh, uses entry points itself uh, to advertise additional commands in your setup line. So uh, we can, we have a bunch of code that's uh, structured as plugins. So um, this, is a, this is an example of how you can use Plux. Plux provides different interfaces to define plugins. So you can just have a class called plugin that inherits from this uh, base plugin class and it works in the same way. Um, but this uh, abstraction allows you to do things like uh, function plugins which we use a lot in, in local stack. This is just a, an illustration. But you could expose uh, configurator functions, for instance, as plugins. So a plugin just has a namespace and a name. In this particular uh, example, we use the function name as the plugin name. And now you have the, all of the ingredients that you need for an entry point, which is the left-hand side is that you have the namespace uh, in the top, and then the left-hand side is the name, and the right-hand side points to some piece of code. And the big problem of, the, of, of things like Pluggy and, and other plugin frameworks is that you need to, either they, they're based on conventions, so the frameworks know where the code lives. In PyTest, for instance, you've probably written like a conf test file or something. This is just a convention, and PyTest knows where to look up your, your plugins there. Um, but we wanted to give developers freedom how to organize their code and where to put it, so we couldn't really rely on conventions. But we also couldn't have this big registry anymore of you know, maintaining entry points. So what Plux does is it discovers these entry points from your code. So there's a build step involved now, which is the drawback. Um, but you can just write your plugin, regenerate the entry points, which is done automatically in our, our build chain. Uh, and then you, we distribute the, the entry points from that. And then at runtime, uh, you just have this plugin manager class. You set the uh, namespace that you want to get the plugins from, and then you just load them. So in this case, you know these configurator plugins they configurate uh, runtime, and then you pass that runtime to the configurator functions. And you can do all sorts of stuff with this, and we use this extensively. In fact, our whole extension system is another layer around this, um, and it allows you to. Uh, in, to build third-party Python distributions, put them on PyPI, and install it into the container. And it's, th it, that's a little bit involved, um, but if you're interested in that, come talk to me afterwards. It's a, uh, it's a great way to sort of put additional functionality into LocalStack. Okay, um, I said it's like pluggability, we need to pull in a lot of third-party tools. One thing that I wanted to talk about, but I'm just running out of time, is uh, monkey patching. So actually, Valdemar, who's also here in the audience, gave a talk about LocalStack uh, last year at EuroPython. It was more uh, oriented around how to use LocalStack. Um, but there was a, a, a piece that, a, a bit of the talk goes into runtime code patching, why we need that. Um, we, again, we bring in a lot of third-party tools, and what makes Python, so I, this is something I appreciate very much, is just the openness of um, the, the software. It's so easy to look into third-party software. Uh, and also to patch it, like no need for bytecode instrumentation or something, you just you know, replace attributes and then you're good to go. And we do that a lot. There are some problems with this, um, obviously, and again, you can find a little bit more details in this talk. Okay, so much for pluggability. So LocalStack is a pluggable system in that it, it, um, you can plug into LocalStack itself, um, but also we plug into other systems a lot and Python helps us do that. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about is parity. I mentioned parity in the beginning. It's, uh, it's what we say when we mean that local stack behaves like AWS. It, it needs to because it's, it's supposed to be a drop-in replacement. And there are certain strategies we have in place to maintain parity. One is this, you know, auto-generating the APIs and getting pull requests and things like that. But this is just specification-based. Parity is all about behavior-based um, uh, matching. So this is such an important con uh, concept. In fact, we have a, a blog post just about this, so you can find that in our engineering blog. Um, but just a, like a brief excerpt. So a thing that we built around PyTest, and we, if you go to the local stack test code base, you can see almost every feature of PyTest being used there. It's such an amazing framework, and it does so much for us. Uh, and, and we build additional tooling around this. So here you can see what we call a snapshot test. A snapshot test is, uh, it, it runs against a real uh, cloud provider, and then um, it collects the responses from that cloud provider and puts it into uh, a JSON file. So we do some, like these transformers you see in the beginning, they're responsible for replacing things like auto-generated IDs um, and, and dates uh, and things like that from the actual uh, response, because we can't match those. We're, when we randomly generate ideas, like we, IDs, we can't uh, match anything. So we have a way to uh, replace those. 
but when, uh, for example, generated IDs are referenced multiple times in the response, we check that, so that's important. And you can see a bunch of uh, fixtures being used here. So the Lambda client, for instance, is just the AWS client, the Boto Core client. Create Lambda is a factory fixture, so it creates Lambda functions and then tears them down at the end of the test, so we use that a lot. So this is a great uh, framework to have, um, co it's basically just contract testing. And then when you run this against local stack, you get a nice report uh, <clears throat> that things are missing or things, are, things don't match. And again, we can't jump on everything, um, but this system gives us at least a way to write a test we know runs against AWS. Um, and then we can sort of pick and choose what we want to implement. So in most cases, we don't need to uh, fully support the entire API operation. Uh, we can just, uh, we get away with, with implementing like 80% of it. And then you, your, your use case is enabled. And now, now that we have all of these tools, we can reason over the API, we can uh, generate you know, lists of services and API operations, we have this parity testing, we have the recording of the responses, we can go and generate uh, coverage pages. So if you go to the docs, you can actually very fine grain see, you know, this, is the, this is the Lambda coverage overview, each API operation, whether it has a test or not, whether it's AWS validated the test, so whether we know that it behaves in the same way. And then you can even click on, on particular API method, create function for instance, and see which test covers this particular API operation. And like, this, is, uh, this is a completely different uh, type of uh, code coverage, um, which is much more high level, so it's basically API uh, coverage. And we're sort of exploring this idea of how to communicate to users the coverage, how, how well tested local stack is, other than you know, the, the classic um, code coverage metrics. Okay, so coming to conclusions, some takeaways. Open source software is just fantastic. I mean, it, the, the community gives us so much and we try to give back to the community. We're maintainers of a bunch of uh, open source uh, projects. We also contribute back to open source projects. And just the openness also of the Python ecosystem and also the language just enables us really, really, um, really, really well. The dynamic code loading is a big part of local stack, and, and if you have this problem of modularization and multiple distributions and you need, this, uh, you need to pull this in, uh, go check out Flux. I think it can really solve some of the problems you may be having. Um, those are some obvious things as well, like pick your battles. We have to be very careful and deliberate about where we put in our effort. You remember the EC2 file with the 600 API methods. We can't implement it all. Um, but we can focus on 80%, and again, Python just helps us get these 80% done really, really quickly. Uh, consider the patterns when migrating frameworks. Some of the uh, patterns that are well established in software engineering, they, a lot of them come from object-oriented programming, but they can be a real uh, facilitator for these kind of lift and shift migrations that we were doing with all of the service providers. Have code introspection in place, so be able to understand your code base and reason over it, generate reports and things like that, immensely useful. And what I learned is uh, scaling your team also means scaling the code base. We spend a lot of time thinking, okay, we need to scale this team now, we have six people now, and then we need to be like this many people at the end of the year, um, figuring out where the bottlenecks are in the code base. Um, and, and proactively addressing that with framework migrations is, is uh, just as important as just the functionality of the product. And with that, one last thank you to the community and the contributors to LocalStack. We have, um, I think by now, over almost 500 contributors. So also, if you're interested in contributing, please go find us on GitHub. Um, and thanks so much for coming. <laughs>